Um, there's been others. There's been a gentleman from the Spanish church that's recovering at home. We pray for him. And Lord, we just pray now that after this week, Lord, we have mourned the loss of one of our church members, that you will start to help that period of mourning to turn into a period of joy as you restore our hearts and our souls. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say it. Amen. 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 All right, so we're going to sing. We're going to sing, Lord, you lift your name on high. All right, we're going to sing it with joy and enthusiasm, okay? Oh. 
may be seated. Okay, do we have someone to pray for the offering today? Anybody? Al, you look awful lonely sitting out there. Would you like to come pray for the offering? Here he comes. All right. Amen. Good job. Does that make a difference? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I, it's a funny thing about the switches. Somebody told me that one time. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I get to fill in for the uh, the offering uh, prayer, but my wife was supposed to be here and do the regular one. I don't know who's doing that. So, okay. Cindy's doing that. So, again, I think this morning it's past the buck. That's called those reindeer games. Is this that good? Yeah, can I get your tie and pass in the buck for a minute? Yeah. I didn't mention, but there is a plate back there, and you can give online, and if you want to do with a credit card or a debit card, you can see Dina and do it that way. So, but if you're really brave, you can use the U.S. mail, amen? <laughs> <laughs> All right. This uh, next song we're going to do for our prayer song today is called Creating Me a Clean Heart. It comes from Psalm 51. If I know Psalm 51, you probably will if I talk about it. Um, Brother Tony, if you have put his hand up, I don't be worried. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, David in his life, you all know this story, he really messed up. He he did some really bad things, and Nathan the prophet came to him, and he told him, and David was immediately convicted, and he fell on his face and cried and, and repented right away, but still there was a price to pay. He lost a child because of that sin, and when he wrote Psalm 51, he said things like, you know, he was just born in sin. In sin, his mother did conceive him. Um, he didn't try to hide from any of it. Um, he said, Lord, you've rightly judged me. Um, he didn't try to tell God he'd made a mistake. Um, he just fell on his face before the Lord. And he talked about his bones being crushed by it. His heart was obviously broken. And some of the other parts of that song, if you take time to read today, I encourage you to do it. Um, in the end, it says, A broken and contrite heart, Lord, you will not despise. Um, pride and, and things that we put in our life sometimes when we want to live in the world, we don't even realize we're doing it, do we? All of a sudden, the pride of life is too important. But this was one of those points David said, Lord, it's, I'm just wrong. There's nothing I can say, but I want a relationship back. And that's what this song says. So if you sing it, think about David and you know, and I don't know about your life, I know about mine, I've got my own things and uh, God always heals us because sometimes we walk with our limbs but I will never forget, I don't want to go back here again. Make me a clean heart, oh God, renew the right spirit within me. Oh, God, 
So that person, but we have a hard time internalizing and saying, what about me, Lord? What, what am I doing? What, what can I do? So I kind of saw the song and um, looked up Psalms 51 too, and it says, wash away all my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. Amen. So that's why we have Lord, because, and we thank you, so pray with me, Lord, thank you for your son, for him coming down and giving us the opportunity to cleanse all of our sins by just us repenting, kneeling in front of you, and asking for forgiveness. Lord, we ask this, and, and we ask that you would be with us and guide us, that the Holy Spirit would be within us. Let us be the light that you want us to be. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts to the word that's going to be brought today and that you would help us to take it deep into our hearts and take it outside. Your church is not here, but out there where we need to speak your word and show your word by our actions, Lord. We ask this in your son's heavenly name. Also, want to welcome our visitors today, and please extend a hand of fellowship to them before they leave today. It's good to have our son Andy and his wife Ashley with us today. We pray for Ashley's mom. She's been recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, so we need to be praying for her. Her name is Lisa Schrader, so we're going to be adding her to the prayer list. I think she no longer be on it. Um, and with no further ado, I want to introduce our guest speaker, whom I already brother in Christ, I can tell. Tony Johnson, everybody give him a hand. Give him a hand. All right, I'm glad to be here this morning, and uh, I already feel like I've been blessed. Great message through the song, and through the word, and through the prayer, and, and so I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, some of you heard just a little bit from me. I have been a Bible education for years, and I'm just trying to 
and I came down here and I just moved to the house uh, from we're in a transition state just now. now I'm preaching. One mile where I'm serving now is assistant principal over at Snyder Elementary and I'm enjoying it. Been a, it's been a really good transition and uh, I'm excited to share with you this morning a message I think that the Lord has laid upon my heart to uh, share with you and to the church. I think it's good and it's timely that as we gather together that we remember some of the basic things of Scripture and that those are the things that are the foundation. That's what I want to talk about this morning. And so simple two verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's uh, verses that you might can quote perhaps better than I can read them. So, But uh, I think it'll be a familiar Scripture. But the good thing about Scripture is that it's a living Word of God and is if we open our hearts and minds up to the Lord and say, what do you say to me about that today? It may be different than what he said to you about it last year, last month, 10 years ago. And so we serve a living God. And so if we are part of that body of Christ, that is that living, breathing fellowship, then he can speak to us new again to it. And if we ask that prayer to be on our hearts, I believe we'll go from here and we'll say that it was good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So let's read that uh, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 12. Romans, Paul speaking to the church at Rome, which is the church, and we are the church, although we're not in Rome. So uh, it transcends time. Verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This morning, I want us to focus on uh, those two verses. I really want to focus really on verse one. Uh, but before we do that, I want you to consider with me that, that in order to really live out verse one, verse two is somewhat of a blueprint of how to do verse one. So I want us to think of it in that way. Verse 2 is somewhat, if you will, it's like a prerequisite to really getting to the meat of verse 1. And, and we know what prerequisites are. You have those uh, in life and a lot of things, and especially, and I come from uh, being bivocational bi bi in education, and you know you have prerequisite classes that you have to take all through school, even in uh, college. And, and so one of the things that, that I've spent most of my time is being camped out in the elementary world, and those prerequisite classes are broken up somewhat in grade levels, as you know. We have K through 8, and most of those, uh, if you can't get past one, you have to stay there until you get all the skills down, because if you don't, then by the time you get to the uh, the eighth grade, then you're not prepared for high school. So, you know, those are kind of prerequisites. And then you get into those things. And the purpose of a prerequisite, as you know, is to so that you have a strong foundation and you can be successful in what you're about to do in the next grade level. And in college, you think uh, you have to have those prerequisite classes as well because they want you to be successful. I went to Warner Southern, uh, Warner University, and I felt that, uh, hey, I was a believer since 12, and I knew scripture, but you had to take some prerequisite Bible classes for you to take other classes. You had to take prerequisite education classes. And so you want to have a strong foundation. And in math, it's really the, the case. Because in math, it's so sequential, and the, the study of math is so sequential, is that if you miss a few steps, then you're going to have some issues. And that's why we see students in upper elementary that feels like, well, I'm not such a good math student. Or I'm a poor math student. And it's not that they won't have the ability to learn it. It's just they missed some steps. And so they didn't get those prerequisite steps. And so what we found out in education, which is a good thing, from Alabama to uh, Winter Haven, Florida, and I was over in Point Sienna, it's all been the same. When a student who is missing some skill levels and they're missing some things in math, let's say, uh, and, and, they, and you get some help with that student and, and you say, where are you missing? And you go all the way back to this is what they know for sure. And you start to build back up. It's called uh, intervention or remediation. And, and then all of a sudden that student catches up and they catch up at an accelerated rate because they already have some foundation. And then all of a sudden, guess what? Now they think, hey, they can do this and they can become a good math student and they have that confidence. 
I want us to think, because some of you out here uh, today, whether you're live or uh, whether you're watching from a distance, think, well, I can relate to that because I wasn't very good at a math student or math's not my thing now. But I want us to take what we know as a pattern about this subject area, because we all have kids or grandkids or ourselves who experience this. And I want us to put that in, in line with this scripture, and I want us to look at that as, as a pattern. And that's what really math is, isn't it? It's a pattern. And so I want us to think about this concept as a pattern to what Paul is saying here. And I want to ask a question this morning. And I believe that if we consider it sincerely, I think that we will make some strides in understanding what God might would have us to uh, take away from this message and, and this actual scripture itself. The question that I want to ask us this morning is, could it be that this is similar to our Christian faith and that, that we don't really understand how to live out verse 1 because we haven't taken the time and the effort to be effective at living out verse 2? We're going to talk about that in a little detailed way. And, and I want us to remember that, that verse 2, being successful in verse 2, takes time and effort, but it doesn't mean perfection, just like in school. If you're proficient, it doesn't mean you make 100, but it means you make, you're proficient. And, and although we're not perfect until Christ comes back, we have the ability to be perfect through him and through him only. It's called sanctification that, that we preach on and that we study on. And, and, but, but we do, like David in Psalms 51, we have those moments where we, we don't quite live up to the standard. And, and so that's why Christ came, as we've heard already this morning. But I want us to think about that and, and ask that question. Could it be that maybe as believers, sometimes we don't live out verse 1 and we can't really be a living sacrifice like we want to, maybe because verse 2 is something that we need to work on. And we're going to look into those two things uh, in depth. I believe that we're going to discover one thing this morning, that the better we are at doing verse 2, the more effective we're going to be at living out verse 1. And so as we look into those two, I want us to think about that. And so let's think about verse 2 and what he, Paul said uh, directly to us. He said this, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul said, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, as a math person, I love the word pattern because uh, it's pretty easy to follow. Uh, you can follow a bad pattern or a good pattern, but nonetheless, it's pretty simple to figure out which way it's going. And Paul said the world has a pattern and we are to not conform to it. We're not to be like it. And there are lots of worldly patterns and we could spend all day and every Sunday, and I'm excited to be here with you this month for three of those Sundays, and we wouldn't even have time to touch the patterns that the world has set. But I think that if we go back and we look at the original pattern, uh, we can see that every pattern that the world has today is stemmed from this original pattern. It's in Genesis 3. We won't go there this morning, but I'd like to encourage you to go back and kind of read that. It's the story of the fall of man, and you see, uh, read those things about that. But, but what happens is this. The pattern that was set in the beginning, if you remember Genesis 3, verse 2, Adam and Eve had it all, right? They had everything. It was a great setup, if you will. They had everything they needed and more. They had a good relationship with God, with each other. Everything was just great. It was wonderful. And then what happens? In comes Satan, the serpent, the devil himself. And he begins to twist. If you go back and read that, it's really good if you think about it with some fresh eyes. He begins to take God's word, but he twists it. You know, the serpent comes to Eve and says, Now, did God really say that you can't eat from any tree? Now, listen to those words. Any tree in the garden? And Eve replies somewhat like, Well, no, he said we could eat from any tree. Except for the one. So, see, already he's in a conversation like, don't even talk to the devil, right? Don't even, don't even give them the opportunity. Don't give them the opportunity. But see, God is like, no, he said, you can't eat from any. So here we are in this conversation, and then it all gets tangled up. 
And she convinces him that, hey, well, really the reason he's saying that is that he, you'll be more like him. And uh, he didn't want that. You see, and then what happened was the fall came and this fruit, they said, you know, an apple, you see that. We don't know what kind of fruit. I think it might have been a passion fruit because, you know what, she had more passion to do what she wanted than she did what God wanted. So I don't know. Whatever. It was a fruit, right? It was a fruit. It was something she wasn't supposed to do. She did. She disobedient and sin entered the world. Well, that was the pattern. They knew what God said. She listened to other people and she disobeyed. That's a worldly pattern. And if you think about it, every pattern that the world has today stems from that same basic pattern. We know what God says. We have his word. We have uh, people who have experienced those things of God and we have the saints and we have those things that, that we can pull back from history if it hadn't been erased yet. We have those things, and yet we know what God says, but we listen to other people, and then we disobey. You ever listen to somebody that has good intentions, and they've talked you into something or out of something that you already knew what you should be doing? I hate to say that I've done that. There have been some good people who've talked me out of some things that I knew God wanted me to do, and there have been some good people who I've allowed to talk me into some things I knew God didn't want me to do. And they had good intentions, and, and I probably had the worst because I wanted to find another way, and I wanted a good person to tell me. And you can find a person to tell you what you want them to tell you anytime. The scripture says this, beware, because in the last days, people will have itching ears. They'll want you to tell them, and we fall into that pattern sometimes, and we have to be careful. And Paul said, don't do that. Don't fall into a pattern of the world, but to be transformed into another pattern, a godly pattern. So man fell, God said something, they listened to others, and they disobeyed. And then the pattern was set. You know, God said to Satan, in fact, if you think about it, we talk about good people uh, doing things that might lead you astray. You think about Peter was a pretty good guy, wouldn't you say? I mean, uh, scripture says that upon this rock I'll build my church, Jesus told him. But if you remember Peter, uh, he was in the same boat. He, he had good intentions. And he was talking about now's the time and I'm going to the cross and this is what I've come for. And Peter says, oh no, you're not going to do that, not me, I'll die for you. And Jesus looked at him and you know what he said, if you remember that scripture. Jesus did look and say, now Peter, thanks for your confidence and I appreciate that. You're such a good brother and you love me and I love you and, and that's so good. He didn't say that, did he? Thank you for your concern for me. Oh my goodness, I know you put it on Facebook and everything. Thank you for that. Uh, Peter, you're so good and kind. Jesus looked straight at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind. You have the things of man. You don't worry, you're not concerned about what God's plan is. You just like it that I'm here with you. And although that may sound good and warm and fuzzy, that's not God's plan. So get behind me, he said to his good friend. You see, the pattern of this world can slip up on you and you can be in it and not even know it. And so that's why. So how do you do that? How do you keep from getting into a pattern that the world has set? How do you keep from getting into this pattern of knowing what God says and listening to other people? Well, good thing that uh, Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this because he gives us the answers. I love tests with the answers. Those are the best kind. You just have to search for them. Uh, in school, we say, I have some young people here. You've heard this. Find the text evidence, right? Or, you know, uh, justify your answer with the text evidence. Well, it's all right here in this text, okay? We just have to look for it, and we can justify God's way opposed to man's way. And so it's a good thing to do. So let's take a look at that. He said, get behind me, say, go directly. He said, don't do that. That's not what, what God has in mind, Jesus said. Don't listen to others. So God says something and we listen to others and then we disobey. That's a bad pattern, Paul said. Don't do that. Don't fall into the pattern of this world because 
disobedience is sin regardless of the level of that disobedience. And sin, Scripture says, has the penalty of death. And death is what Jesus came to do so that we would not be indebted with that great price of death. Jesus came for that very reason. And Paul says that as believers, we must not conform to that pattern because he come to this world to break us from that pattern. Knowing what God says and doing it is the only pattern that we are to follow. You see, non-believers follow the pattern of the world. If you think about it, uh, because they, they are, most people are good people, we say, and we are in a Christian nation, and most people think, well, that's okay, and that's, again, I like the way what the Bible says, and I like, you know, Christian people and stuff, but they listen to themselves, and they do themselves, and they don't, most are not atheists in our nation, but they still don't do what God says. You know why? Because they do uh, what they want to do. It's that self. And, and to, to be simplistic about it, the thing that you hear all the time and you've heard for a long time is sin, as the Bible talks about, the, the center of sin is I, and that's how you spell sin the last time we checked, right? I, self is always the problem. And so Paul said, break that pattern. And so how do you do it? Because Paul said, if we're not a citizen of this world, he says that we're a citizen of heaven. And so if we're not a citizen of this world, then we should follow the pattern of a citizen of heaven. But we're still in the world, and that's the problem. We're in the world, but we're not of it. So how do you justify those two things? How in the world do you keep from following after a pattern because they're all over the place and you can step right in and not know it? And how do you do that if we're believers, if we're Christians, if we're, we're of a different uh, of realm, we're heavenly people, we're heavenly minded, that's our final home, so how do we walk through this world and not fall our, ourselves, find ourselves into a pattern? Well, Paul says that in the second part of this verse, and I'd like to read that to you and bring this together. The second part of verse 2 tells us exactly how we must do this, and he says this, do not conform any longer to the power of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I want us to think about that, renewing of our minds. This is a thing that we have to consider daily. This is something that we must do by the minute. And sometimes, we're, depending on what uh, you're in, you have to do it every second. You know, don't let me say that. Don't let me do that. Lord, help me not to, to speak. Help me not to. You have to renew your minds constantly. And we have to do that because if we don't uh, put forth that effort, uh, we will not get the results that we want and that God wants. It takes work to renew your mind constantly, but it is worth doing it because peace with God, you can't really put a price on it. Uh, you can't put a price on knowing that you're doing what God has called you to do and you're in right relationship with him. Then you'll be able, Paul says, to test and approve to see what God's will. Now, here's the thing about God's will. We know from Scripture that God's is for not one man to perish, but for all to come to repentance and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the overarching will. Now, that's the same will for all of us to plug into that. And God's will has certain do's and don'ts in here, perhaps, but his will for you individually is a permissive will because he may allow you to do some things he doesn't allow me to do, you to go places that he may not allow me to go. Because his overarching was that everybody gets saved. And so if we're all little soldiers and did the same thing and lived the same place and acted the same way, how would we reach the lost, you see? So here's the thing about it. God's overarching will is for us to do certain things as a church, as a group together. There are certain things, you know, that we know he didn't come to do away with the commandments, but he upped the game on it, right? He said, do not kill, but I say, do not hate. That's his will for us to not do that. Every one of us is the same. We're in the same category for that. But the permissive will of God is allows you to do and be and go in places and certain things that maybe that's not where I'm supposed to be and live and do and go. Because he wants everyone reached so that they all can become saved. You follow me? So that's why Jesus, if you think about it, that's why Jesus went to the temple. He came to church. He was up in church for it. He ate and drank with sinners too. Some people called him the son of God. Some people called him a drunkard. That didn't bother him. 
because he wasn't worried about the pattern of the world and what they said. He went and did what God told him to do. And that's why his life was a life of service because as Paul says here, service is really what it's about. And we're going to see that here. Just like a prerequisite math class, when we get verse 2 down and we understand that, that we are to renew our minds so that we can avoid falling into a pattern of the world. That's what verse 2 said. Constantly renew your mind so that you don't get into this worldly pattern. And if we do that, and once we get effective at that, and once we uh, get to where we can, can manage that, then we're able to do verse 1. And so let's look at verse 1, because that's what uh, Paul began with. He said, being a sacrifice, a living sacrifice is your spiritual state. It displays what you are spiritually. Paul said that. He said that your living sacrifice, our sacrifice, our living sacrifice, our life that we live shows our spiritual state. And so you can't see a person's spiritual state. Only God knows that, right? But you can see a person's spiritual state in context when they live a life of sacrifice. And Paul said, verse 1, he urged us to be a living sacrifice, and he said, which is your spiritual act of worship. You see, when you try to be spiritual, you just become religious. You don't try to be spiritual. Now, now we know that there are people who, sadly today, there's religious kind of constraints upon people, just like they did in Jesus' day. Some, some people have a checklist. Well, if you have the Spirit, then you'll do this, and you'll do this, and you'll do this, and you'll do this, and now you're filled with the Spirit. Congratulations. You've done it. Now let's go to the next step. See, that's called re just religious blah, blah. Okay. G Paul said that if you are a living sacrifice, if you will become a living sacrifice, if you will renew your minds all the time so that you're not falling into the pattern of a world, and if you will begin to sacrifice and live for others, then that in itself is your spiritual life, and that's your spiritual worship. And, and God says that is wonderful, and that's what I want is for you to worship me like that. Be spiritual like that. Basically, be real. Don't be fake. Be real. And, and what happens is, Paul said it, it, it is the very best. He says, this is your spiritual worship. Jesus, again, desired to follow after God and what the Father had said and not concerned about what men said. And he was a living sacrifice. You know, this pandemic has gotten us into a little bit of a sideways deal. In the church included. Uh, but you know, if we stay strong, if we stay faithful uh, during this time, and we stay obedient, then our spiritual act of worship doesn't change, whether we're here or we're home or what have you. But God has a plan for us, and he has a plan for us to be the church that's living, a breathing church that's sacrificing for others. And I want us to think about this, consider patterns of this world, again, are so easy to fall in. You know, God says this, but then what does the world say? And I, and I was just looking at, at the news feed earlier because you don't have to look all the way back in Jesus' day to see the same thing. It's going on now. It just looks a little different. You'll be glad to know that we're in Florida, not in California, because in California, now this report Friday, just declared that California's rules were unconstitutional. I don't know if you heard that or not. Uh, they were trying to get houses of worship to not go. You can't go, you can't worship indoors in California. It went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said Friday, no, you cannot say that this business is open and publicly and the church can't be open publicly. You can't say that. Thank the Lord. Okay. Now, but California still has trouble. You still can't shout or chant or sing in that worship service. Oh, no, that could spread the coronavirus. Uh, yes, you can. Now, the coronavirus is serious. It's real. It's, it's, a, it's a real thing. But I want to ask you this. A pattern, let's just think about the pattern of the world. The world says, oh, don't do it. And man, we just buckle down. Don't do anything. If you're sick, 
And if you're a health risk, keep distance whether it's corona or anything. You know, stay home. But here's my question for you. And this is just me asking because this is what the scripture says and then let's think about it. This is why I say it's so easy for a pattern. Just watch this. Scripture, we know scripture says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more as you see the day approaching. Yes. Encourage one another, gather together. I know virtual is good and live is good and that's how some people can only come and that's fine. But I want to ask you this. If I can go to public, I think I might go to church. <laughs> oh, I'm coming on some time. If I can go to the restaurant, it says mask on. My goodness, I got one here because I'm going to eat. I may go afterwards. I'll put it on. Mask on. Here we go. Welcome. I walk six feet and I sit down. I don't have to have one. Because I'm hungry. <laughs> and Corona disappeared because I took my mask on. I sat down. I was thinking about getting one of them mobile scooters and just ride around the line. You see what I'm saying? Here's the thing. If you're sick, hey, stay. If you help, you want to wear a mask in church, out, wear it. Do it. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Amen. Jesus. Okay? But here's my thing. If you can't come to church and wear a mask and sit in the corner, why can't you go to these other places? Do you see? Is there a disconnect? Is it just me? I don't know. It may just be me. I'm just a plain old Alabama country boy. But you know, here's the thing. The pattern of the world says it's this and it's got to be this way. But you know, there's another pattern. The pattern says, what is this? If I can, before this pandemic hit, if I could come to church, I'd come to church. If I was sick, I wouldn't. Same thing. Does God change? Does his pattern change? No. Uh, so just questions to think about. The patterns of this world is so easy to get involved in. And you have people who are believers that says, it's birth begins at conception. God knew you before you were born. But we're going to say women's rights. That's not abortion. We can't say that word. That's not political. Correct. We can't say murder of a child because you know what? That's, that's not politically correct. Are you with me? It's so easy to fall into the pattern of the world to say, well, yeah, that is, and that's the law, and this is. God says something. And we're obedient. And that's the only pattern that we're to be in. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual form of worship. And do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then, and only then, will you be able to test and approve to see what God's will is. You know why the church sometimes don't know what God's will is? Let's just follow it backwards real quick in closing. We don't want to put the time to renew our mind and to test the things that people tell us and say and then compare it to God's wisdom and say, no, wait, that's not right. I can't think that way. I've got to think this way. No, I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to believe that that's not, that that's an embryo. That's a child. You're going to, you're going to take that child's life all the way up to the day of birth until the umbilical cord is cut. I don't believe that. I'm going to renew my mind. I'm going to think on my own. I'm going to put my mind in the Word of God and I'm going to do that and I'm going to have my mind renewed so that I can think clearly and understand what God wants me to understand and that I can live out this verse of verse 1 where I can be then a living sacrifice giving to others in love, sharing the truth in love. There's nothing wrong. We've gotten to become a society where we can't disagree with anybody because we'll hurt their feelings. I can disagree with you all day and love you and I can, you should be able to do the same thing as a believer. And then guess what? God's got the final word on it. Because it really doesn't matter what I say or think. Or honestly, I have to tell you this. It doesn't matter what you say or think. If it's not what this says or think, then we're both wrong. So we've got to go back to the drawing board and figure that one out. So Paul had a great verse, these two verses here as he set up as he's talking to the church in Rome. And by the way, Rome had just as many problems. We could go into that uh, problem similar to what we're having today. Probably even worse. Uh, they did some practices and things that were worse than what we would think. And even in our uh, state now, uh, they had some issues that were societal issues that were probably a lot worse 
than what we have today, yet God's word still was true. And I want to challenge you to think about God's word today still being true. And back to our original question in closing, could it be that we struggle with being a living sacrifice because we don't take the time to renew our minds and get out of the patterns that the world has put? Could, could it be that's why we don't have a problem sacrificing ourselves for others because we hadn't taken the time to, to do really good at verse 2 and therefore we find it's a struggle for verse 1? Just a question. I have to say at times in life, I'd have to say yes for many. But you have to you have to answer it yourself. And I think it's time that the church asks themselves hard questions and take the time to get on our knees and to find out what the answer is. You know, this morning, I don't know what your need is. Uh, I don't know what the Lord's saying to you. But I'd encourage you to listen to him. I'd encourage you to listen to him. It may be that, that you need to, to focus on uh, renewing your mind a little bit more. Maybe uh, you might be in the habit of saying what you think instead of thinking about what you're saying, Lord. I'm into that habit sometimes. I don't know about you. It may be that you need to work on being that living sacrifice, you know, doing something. Jesus did something. He went and did things. He didn't just talk and he didn't stand in the pulpit and just preach. He got out and lived and worked with people. I love hearing about working in the homeless shelters and, and being the hands and feet of Christ. Uh, God has blessed this church and he's going to continue to bless this church if we'll continue to be a living sacrifice. I don't know what your need is, but I do know this. Uh, God's here to meet it. And so if you would ask him, he would do it. As the musicians come, I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to close. And I want to encourage you to, the most important things you can do in any service is to say, God, what's that saying to me? And when he says to you what it's saying, you just obey. Don't go talk to someone else about it. When God says something, go ahead and do it. Make that transaction illegal. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word. God, your word is timeless, and although we're in different times now than we've ever seen in our country, in our nation, and perhaps our world, Lord, you stand timeless, and your word stands timeless. And God, I just pray that you would help us to be that living sacrifice for you. And Lord, if we're having a struggle, if we're having a difficult time really sacrificing being the Christian you've called us to be, help us to be honest with ourselves to see if we need some work on renewing our minds. And, and maybe, Lord, we may be finding ourselves in a pattern that the world has said and we didn't even really know it. And help us to get out of those patterns. Help us to get out of those things that would not allow us to be that true living sacrifice that you've called us to be. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you all were blessed by that. And by the way, that was, that was a great band there. You know, he, he was talking a lot about a lot of good things. But there's this thing like everybody forgot about called common sense. And that's what it's really all about. It's a reasonable service. It only makes sense. Search it out. Talk about it. It'll be okay. We're going to sing this good old song, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a glory is the glory divine. Heir of salvation, virtues of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior. Thank you.